the rise and fall of the blob along the west coast, the persistent factors that cause the 1,000 mile mass of warm water to fizzle out. What are you gonna give me? There's a pearl necklace. There's a ring that belonged to your mother. Remembering Harper Lee, the legacy left behind by her masterpiece, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's almost more of an orchestral sound design. And the key to an unforgettable movie, one epic soundtrack. The high and low notes for this year's Oscar nominees. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma. They're asking for the public's help. Investigators are searching for the suspect behind a string of bomb threats at Naval Base San Diego and a nearby shipyard. The false alarms include two triggered this week. KPBS reporter Steve Walsh has more on the evidence found on base. After another bomb threat halted operations this week at Naval, uh, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service and BEA Systems are offering a $5,000 reward for information. Navy officials made the offer at one of the piers which has been evacuated after one of the recent threats. It's my experience that crime doesn't occur in a vacuum. That people who commit crimes tell people about it. And some of our best leads are actually uh, results of people talking to one another. Ten of the 11 threats were handwritten. At least six were short notes scrawled on walls inside Naval Base San Diego and at the adjacent BEA shipyards. Investigators are looking at whether someone with clearance or granted access to the base is responsible. Even a hoax is considered a felony. Commander Kurt Jones said each ship must be evacuated, causing expensive delays in maintenance. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. A huge body of warm surface water along the west coast called the Blob has nearly disappeared from satellite images. The Blob appeared in the Northeast Pacific Ocean in 2013. Researchers believe it was caused by a persistent ridge of high pressure that weakened winds and stopped the circulation of the sea. The stagnant water heated and spread. Sea surface temperatures in the 1,000 mile wide Blob soared as high as 7 degrees above normal. Fish marine life suffered from a lack of nutrients. Researchers say El Nino's strong winds have helped cool the blob, but the warm remnants still exist. So the original blob pattern has either lost its heat to the atmosphere, which basically you know, warms the air and then affects the downstream conditions, or it was mixed into the underlying ocean water, and we can actually see evidence of that. El Nino has also caused above average temperatures of 1 to 2 degrees along the west coast. Water temperatures are expected to return to normal when El Nino dissipates this summer. A new study shows the California Coastal Commission has a consistent record over the past two decades. 80% of requests end up winning approval. All the approval comes with a lot of, you know, uh, negotiation uh, behind the scenes. And then they also come with a law condition. So it's not like, you know, I give you a rubber stamp. You know, I say yes to everything. The agency has been in the spotlight over the controversial firing of executive director Charles Lester. Some coastal advocates worried the situation would weaken coastal protections. A management shakeup at SeaWorld has a San Diego executive leading the way. The company promoted SeaWorld San Diego president John Riley. He will oversee all the theme parks under the SeaWorld brand. Park attendance took a hit since the release of the documentary Blackfish. SeaWorld leaders announced last November that it would phase out its orca shows in San Diego. The company is also challenging a ruling by the Coastal Commission, which called for the end of breeding captive killer whales. A new measure to stop drunk driving accidents may start in the bar. There is an assembly bill that calls on bartenders and workers who serve beer and cocktails to help. It would make it mandatory for them to take classes, teaching them how to identify and deal with a drunk customer. The goal is to keep drunk customers off the road. The bill puts the state's department 
The State's Department Alcohol Beverage Control in charge of managing a four-hour course that servers of alcohol. A medical student from UC San Diego helped write the legislation. I want this to change our whole community, not just the bartenders and the servers. I mean, preventing drunk driving is everyone's responsibility, whether you're behind the bar, or whether you're sitting next to the person at the bar. So I think what this training needs to do is bring it to the forefront of everyone's mind to realize that pouring that drink and setting it in front of them isn't just pouring that drink and setting them in front of it, in front of them. It has the possibility that that person could get into the car and drive home and hit your family member on the way. If the bill passes, California will be the 19th state to require responsible beverage training for servers. The showdown between Apple and the FBI over a San Bernardino shooter's iPhone is heating up. The Justice Department fired back at the company for refusing to help unlock a phone used by one of the gunmen in the San, Diego, in the San Bernardino attack. Rather, Federal prosecutors argue Apple could easily help unlock the smartphone in question without putting anyone else's privacy at risk. Apple disagrees. In the meantime, California lawmakers are weighing in on the debate. Some oppose placing phone privacy concerns as a higher priority than state and national security. So what Apple, in essence, is saying, if there's information on a phone for child pornography, human trafficking, a homicide investigation, you can be assured law enforcement cannot access it, even with a search warrant by a judge. A lawmaker threatened to write legislation that would force Apple to comply if it continues to resist. Democratic presidential candidates get ready to rumble. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are entering the ring in tomorrow's Nevada caucus. A recent poll by the Associated Press reveals 72 percent of Democrats now believe Sanders could win the general election. Both candidates are head to head in the state's polls. And GOP candidates are fighting for the military vote in South Carolina's primary. Associated Press reporter Josh Replaugel says more veterans seem to stand behind Donald Trump. The candidates are rallying hard. So if you're a veteran, will you raise your hand, please, so we can thank you for your service. Thank you. Each chasing the veteran vote, a key demographic in the Palmetto State. I laid out a comprehensive plan to rebuild the military from the ground up to keep this country safe and defend America from the threats across the world. That military, that retired military vote is very key and very crucial. Dr. Scott Buchanan, a political expert at the Citadel Military College, says those veterans and thousands more active military members stationed at more than a half dozen installations across the state will make or break which candidate will become the GOP nominee. And so they help determine the winner who in history show indicates is usually on the way to the nomination. And out on the campaign trail, veterans are eager for change. I'm not too happy with what the VA has been doing. Definitely recommend a strong military. I think we've gone downhill in that regard. The times are hard for many of them. Donald Trump confident he's convinced veterans he's the right choice. In South Carolina, they just did a poll. I went up 8% with the vets. Trump's bravado and bombastic approach has caught on. Among enlisted. Uh, it is more of a Trump uh, uh, support than anyone else. And that's because they're frustrated? They're frustrated. Nearly every GOP nominee over the past 80 years won the South Carolina primary. <laughs> Campaigns keeping that in mind as they ramp up efforts for an important voting day Saturday. Josh Replogle, The Associated Press. The nation pays its final respects to the late Justice Antonin Scalia. Paul Bearers carried his casket into the Supreme Court this morning. The eight remaining justices joined family members and former law clerks inside the Great Hall. Scalia's clerks are now taking 30-minute turns standing near his casket. They plan on doing so until his funeral tomorrow. On his way back to Rome, Pope Francis makes some startling comments. A former San Diego police officer sues the Department for Discrimination and Retaliation. And a Balboa Park building is in pretty bad shape for an icon. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. 
It's looking like a warm weekend ahead for San Diego. Heather Waldman gives us the full forecast in tonight's KPBS weather report. We'll be going from cooler and a little bit cloudy over the last couple of days to warmer with much more sunshine through this weekend. Satellite picture shows that Southern California drying out after a couple of sprinkles last evening. We woke up to some sunshine this morning around San Diego County. Still some wet weather in Northern California, but storm tracks are going to stay just there off to the north over the next couple of days. So no big issues coming our way. Closer view of the radar shows that those clouds cleared out very early this morning. There were a couple of sprinkles left over into the mountains, but there too, we're starting to see some drier air take hold, and that's going to be our trend through tonight and into the day on Saturday as well. Here's a look at your temperatures tonight across San Diego County. Ramona will drop to 35 degrees, 43 in Poway, around 52 in San Diego. So as usual, coastal areas will stay a little bit warmer tonight. Mountainous areas dropping closer to the freezing mark, but most will stay above. Of 32 degrees. Again, as we go through this weekend, this high, it sets right back up and it strengthens too. So the offshore flow is going to become stronger. Could be a little bit breezy over the next couple of afternoons, especially northward towards Los Angeles near the Santa Ana's. But those winds are going to help to warm us up pretty nicely. Looks like Monday is going to be the warmest day of the next few. Here we go, starting off with the coast as we go through the next five days. Looking at lots of sunshine, those storm tracks stay well off to the north. And look up the warm-up we've got going on here through this weekend. 69 degrees Saturday, 72 on Sunday, 82 on a Monday. A little bit breezy at times. Tuesday into Wednesday, we uh, stay almost as warm. Upper 70s, still well above average for this time of the year. A little bit farther inland, it's a little bit Milder temperatures will be in the lower 70s on Saturday. Lots of sunshine, maybe a few clouds over the next couple of mornings, but bright blue skies Sunday into Monday. Again, temperatures will crawl their way up into the lower 80s to start the week. A little bit warm for some folks, so make sure you've uh, got plenty of ways to cool down over the next couple of days. Upper 70s Tuesday into Wednesday. Don't forget the sunscreen either. The sun getting stronger as we get closer to the end of winter. Up into the mountains, a little bit cooler as you'd expect. But here, too, still quite mild, near 70 degrees by Monday afternoon. But notice those overnight lows do get close to freezing as skies stay clear overnight. So the mornings and the evenings are definitely going to be chilly, but the afternoons will be very comfortable. Out into the deserts, this will be our warm spot, close to 90 on a Monday. Temperatures will recover back into the middle 80s for Tuesday and Wednesday. Lots of sunshine throughout the week, and lows will stay close to 40 degrees. Heather Waldman, KPBS News. A site at the San Diego Zoo Safari, the six endangered southern white rhinos that were sent to the San Diego Zoo late last year in an effort to save the species are now on exhibit. The rhinos were also sent to aid in conserving the near extinct extinct rather northern white rhinos visitors to the safari park may now be able to see the southern white rhinos in their new 3.5 acre habitat. The Academy Awards are coming up. One unforgettable melody could be the key to an award-winning film. KPBS culture reporter Angela Carone learns the method behind movie music magic from a film composer in Oceanside. Larry Groupe has an enviable commute from his house to his backyard studio. I've been here now 25 years in this location. Group Hay is an award-winning film and television composer. He works from Oceanside, but travels regularly to Los Angeles. I can actually get into Hollywood sometimes faster than the person I'm meeting who's coming from Santa Monica because it's, the traffic is so bad for them. Groupe still composes parts of a score by hand, but these days he's mostly writing with a digital toolbox of instruments. Slowly but surely, adding it all together. He does this after watching a rough cut of a film with the director and editor. And then we take notes about, let's have music here. Also, just as important, let's, not, let's have music not be here. And if we're going to have music here, you know, should it start when the car door opens or when he slams it shut? He then creates a polished demo the director and producers can weigh in on. Once greenlit, he leads an orchestra in recording the score. 
composer John Williams' score for Star Wars The Force Awakens is one of the five nominated for an Academy Award, but Group A thinks it probably won't win. Of the five, uh, I think because of the fact that there is so much of the original Star Wars music in the movie, even though we have these new things too, I don't think it's, it's going to be considered fresh enough. Carter Burwell's score for the movie Carol as a contender. In it, two women are attracted to each other, but it's the repressive 1950s. Burwell approached the score as a way to express the unexpressed feelings between them. He doesn't go huge registers up and high and low. He's kind of all right around in here. And it's just, in this, and for Carol, uh, it just makes it a very personal sounding score. You know, it keeps it within their world, not so much the world that's spinning around them. People are scared of this man. This the other incredible. period film score nominated is for Bridge of Spies. Groupe is a big fan of composer Thomas Newton, who's done the music for many films, including the last few Bond films and American Beauty. He thinks this is a more traditional score from Newman. I think it has to do with the, the fact that it's a historic period piece and there's things that are in there. It's, it, I would not say it's a shining example of what he does that's so intriguing. Uh, but he's doing the right he's doing the right job for the movie. Groupe really likes the score for Sicario. It's by composer Johan Johansson. You hear the orchestra, but also electronic sounds and lots of distortion, which really builds tension. Usually in, the, in these slow-moving drum tracks that he had, and then you hear this distortion over like 45 seconds get more and more distorted, and it just gets angrier and angrier. Got room for one more. The score for Quentin Tarantino's violent western The Hateful Late is also nominated. For me, that's my favorite score. It's by the Italian film composer Ennio Morricone, who at 87 has had a legendary career. All the way back to his probably most iconic film ever, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. And that's so cemented in our psyche as what the Western sounds like. To The Hateful Eight, again, he is so interesting in his orchestration choices. The main theme in the movie is played primarily by Contra Bassoon. And he writes for The Hateful Eight, given its story, uh, a theme that's kind of mysterious. It's kind of a whodunit. It's, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't commit to one thing or the other. Ennio Morricone has never won an Oscar, though he was given a Lifetime Achievement Award in 2007. So which composer will walk on stage next Sunday to get the Academy Award? I think personally it's going to be between Sicario and The Hateful Eight. And I think it's going to go to The Hateful Eight. Which would give Morricone his first Oscar after writing more than 500 original scores for movies and television. Angela Carone, KPBS News. The measure of man in a timeless American novel. Harper Lee was 89 years old. Associated Press reporter Warren Levinson has more on her career before and after To Kill a Mockingbird. Nell Harper Lee, the elusive author of To Kill a Mockingbird, has died at the age of 89. Her publisher confirmed the death to the Associated Press. Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, published in 1960, told the story of a girl nicknamed Scout growing up in a depression era southern town. A black man has been wrongly accused of raping a white woman and Scout's father, the resolute lawyer Atticus Finch, defends him despite threats and the scorn of many. As the civil rights movement grew, the novel inspired a generation of young lawyers and was assigned in high schools all over the country. It became one of the most widely read American novels of the 20th century. The book was made into a film in 1962 with Gregory Peck winning an Oscar for his portrayal of Finch. Mockingbird was Harper Lee's first novel and for decades her only one. But in 2015, HarperCollins published Go Set a Watchman, an earlier draft of the story. In this version, Scout is a grown woman visiting her old hometown. Many readers were distressed at this portrait of a beloved character. 20 years later, Atticus Finch is an angry segregationist denouncing the Supreme Court decision ruling school segregation unconstitutional. Harper Lee began declining interviews in the late 1960s and until late in her life, 
firmly avoided making any public comment at all about her novel or her career. Warren Levinson, Associated Press. Stories from an undeclared war. The Chronicle covers the stories of 150 at-risk students. Producer Maria Hall Brown introduces us to the woman who taught them the power of the written word. My name is Erin Guell. Schools are divided into separate tribes. Freedom Writers, the feature film based on the true story of teacher Erin Gruel and her students who transformed their lives through the written word. Now two decades after their introduction to Room 203, and in their own words, the documentary, Freedom Writers, Stories from an Undeclared War. My, my students enter my class uh, September 6, 1994, and the one commonality that all of my students had was they were very transient. They moved a lot, or they were foster kids, or when you, ha when you grow up in poverty, um, oftentimes you're picking up your stuff and, and leaving. So the commonality that they had is they didn't have stuff that anchored them to their childhood. So there wasn't photos, there wasn't home movies. And I realized that if I could help our, have some kind of archival footage of the time that we were together, initially I thought it was just going to be that one year, the freshman year. So I started taking pictures with Polaroids and I started bringing in my, my video camera. And what I started doing to help with the literature I was using was showing them incredible documentaries to bring the books to life. And one thing led to another, where I was able to stay with this group of students their freshman year, their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year, and dot, 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 we're now at our 20th year. I was able to help these students go off to college to, to graduate and now become these incredible scholars. So we were sitting on 20 years of footage and 20 years of incredible photographs and these mementos and, and timepieces of our time, not just in my classroom, but our adventures outside the classroom. And so we started weaving this together, um, hoping that we could tell a story and hoping that it would have a life outside of room 203, our, our initial classroom. We knew it was like our place. We cared, you know, we offered hugs instead of insults, um, comforting instead of gossip. And we were becoming a family. The beauty of our story is that we kind of put the word fun into dysfunctional family. We are a family regardless of biology and regardless of skin color and, and the gods that we pray to. It's, it's one of the most beautiful elements of our story is that we came together and have stayed together all this time. The name of the book is The Freedom Writer's Diary and we've got some of the Freedom Writers here along with their teacher, Aaron Gruel. Not only did they survive and they are very much alive, but they're thriving and they've got advanced degrees and some of them are working on PhDs and they've got jobs, ironically, that reflect their pain, if that makes sense. A lot of my students became teachers even though they hated education. A lot of them became uh, working with therapists or counselors even though they were tragically abused. Please survive, that's all I can say. Because of the neighborhood I grew up in, I had to pretty much have that persona of somebody that didn't take no mess. That was like my coat of arms to be able to walk through my neighborhood every day. And that just wasn't me. I wasn't that person. That's really what our story is about in the documentary is these freedom writers telling you this was my story as a kid. This is how I overcame those obstacles. But as an adult, these are the things that I need to do to help other kids live and thrive. And so it's a, it's a really holistic story of, of where they were, how they changed, and more importantly, where they are today. When we started writing, this girl kept telling us that it was important for us to tell our own story. And I never truly understood that because I always thought that my story had already been told. I believe that teacher that told me that I was not going to go anywhere. I believe that judge that told me that I was going to go back to juvenile hall. I believed everybody that told me that I was never going to make it. I listened to Ms. G tell us that we could write about whatever we wanted on some stupid journal that she gave us. In the first two weeks, all I wrote was, I hate Erin Gural. If I wasn't on probation, I would probably shank her. But the funny thing that happened to me is that when I wrote that down, it actually made me feel better. 
because I didn't feel anybody cared about how I felt. Because who cares about what happens to some girl in, you know, that's from East LA? Who cares about her? Who cares about her and what she goes through? And somehow that piece of paper, that blank piece of paper cared about what was going on with me and how I felt. A San Diego nonprofit wrapped up its literacy campaign today at Golden Hill Elementary School. Ay caramba, she cried, a perfect nest. She hopped up onto the nest and laid a small egg. Then a duck waddled by. See that? Words Alive ended its 17th annual Share Your Love of Reading campaign with San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner. The nonprofit wants to inspire students from economically depressed areas to read. Words Alive trains and places volunteers for one year stints in classrooms across San Diego County. What Words Alive tries to focus on is the importance that literacy plays as a foundation in everything that we do, in economic success and educational success and being able to navigate effectively in your community and, and advocate for yourself. Yeah. And do you like to read, uh, by yourself? In San Diego's low income areas, there is one book for every 300 children. That's compared to five books per child in affluent homes Great. in the region. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening.